So we've heard about the database and Chi He started the story of how we're going to extract We've got a lot of data, we've got a lot of information, but the, the next step is extracting the, the knowledge from it. So Chihei showed some of the chemical structures that are associated with uh, toxicity. Um, Steve Enoch from Liverpool John Moores University is going to continue that story about how we use the data. Now we've got this immense data resource and these other data resources to extract out structural information that we appreciate are associated with tox data. Okay, so, um, yeah, very much so, sort of building on the last talk about how you can use the data and perhaps interestingly, talk about how you might better predict some stuff. All of my talks start with this slide. This is supposed to be an animated slide, but it's not really worked very well because it's on WebEx. Basically, this slide is supposed to, supposed to indicate the idea of grouping. And anyone that's seen me talk before will have seen this slide a million times, so apologize for that. The idea here is that you wouldn't have had the red and the blue boxes, but the idea here is that if I've got a group of lambs and I can define the properties of lambs and I get another lamb, I can make a prediction about what that, what the lamb's going to be. I once made the mistake of saying about this prediction of what a lamb was going to be at a, uh, an, uh, a meeting organized by Christy Sullivan, who is a vegetarian, that one of the properties of lambs would be that if you got another lamb and you predicted its properties, it would taste good. This wasn't very well received. The point is, is taken though, that you would know, you could define lamb, shape, size, whatever, you get another of those, you can use those properties to predict the properties of a lamb. The same with the banana. Now typically, you then might have some outlying data in your grouping, and if you have no other data to, that fits with, your, with that additional data point, this strange looking beast up here on the, on the top, you can't make a prediction for that particular data point. You can't say, and this is where traditional QSAR would have said, let's just group it all together and make predictions for the whole lot. So you would be able to predict another molecule that fitted your, your lamb group, another one for your banana group, but not one for your unusual data point at the top, which is the lamb banana, which is something that exists. It's in, the, in Liverpool. Unless you were fortunate enough to get more data from your exercise, and all of a sudden you have three groups and you can start to predict the properties. Now this sounds really trivial, but this is kind of where we're going. Grouping, read across, that kind of thing. The key to all of this, of course, is defining chemical similarity, or similarity in general. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in the remainder of this talk. So how do you define chemical similarity? I stole this slide off Mark, so it's his fault if you don't like it. Um, how do you define chemical similarity? Well, you have to define, you have to build a profiler. And a profiler consists of chemical structure alerts, fragments of molecules that define something about those molecules that make them similar. Sounds easy. It's pretty challenging. How do you do it? Well, you can use statistics. The caption says, don't, don't, the data don't make any sense. We'll have to resort to statistics. I quite like that. The other side is lots of hard work. And if you're dealing with toxicology, it's the as I look at the slide, and as you look at the slide, it's the right-hand side that you're really going to have to deal with. We tried stats. It didn't really help us very much. We really end up on the right-hand side, or at least a hybrid of the two. So we're going to talk about how hard work, and by hard work, I normally mean PhD students doing lots of work in the lab. How does hard work get you to a point where you can define chemical similarity, group, and maybe make some predictions? Well, here's some ideas about statistics-based data mining. What can we do with that kind of thing? We can take, and this slide basically says, we can take some data, we can throw some stats at it, and hopefully we'll start to see some fragments of molecules come out the other side that might be useful to us. It's a bit, it's a bit, it, it can work. However, it has some advantages. It's pretty quick. Computers can do things rather rapidly. That's all good. Doesn't require any mechanistic understanding of your toxicological endpoints. I don't think that's an advantage, but it's only advantage can be suitable for, say, say, screening prioritization type events. The disadvantages are you might end up with a black box, and of course, you don't have any mechanistic framework. And as soon as you step towards toxicologists, Nora would probably back me up here, you don't have any mechanistic framework for your group, a toxicologist is, is never going to believe you. So we have to go down the hard work route, which is unfortunate, but that's where we are. And realistically, the hard work route involves going to the literature, having a think about your endpoint, 
What are the potential molecular initiating events that might be important? So what is, what is the underlying science that's telling you about how the chemical you're interested in interacts with the biological system? How does it initiate that pathway that's perturbed leading to toxicity? That's literature work. Trying to find MIEs, that kind of thing. That, however, lets us define alerts, and that lets us start to build the groups we might be interested in. And it allows us to build profilers. Our advantages, of course, you now do have a nice, firm foundation in, in mechanisms. If you go down this route, you end up with a, defining small areas of chemistry, but you do have a good mechanistic rationale. That's a good thing. It's good for hazard identification, and importantly, it's good for grouping. And with grouping, I might actually be able to predict something that pushes me towards understanding what's going on. The disadvantages, and they really are big disadvantages, you'll see at the end of this talk, Effectively, the work in this talk is about is a PhD student's work. Mark Nelms did a lot of this recently. He did a lot of database work as well, but a lot of the work I'm presenting is a PhD student. It's three years worth of work. It's reliant on a detailed mechanistic understanding of, of things that are going on in a biological system. Where do you find that stuff out? You have to read the literature, and lots of it. It's slow, it's manual, it's really quite it takes a certain type of person. So you can basically combine that kind of stuff. And what you can start to do is you can start to try and use some statistics-based methods, chemical similarity, form clusters, and then do some analysis of those clusters with a, me with a mechanistic understanding and try and derive an alert in this fashion. And basically, Mark was interested in mitochondrial toxicity. And basically, all the work here is what he did is he took a mitochondrial toxicity data set here is one, it's 288 chemicals from Zhang et al. And importantly, the second, data, the second point here is 93, hair dye data, 93 data for hair dyes, which are from the SCCS opinions. They're in the Cosmos database. And he did some analysis. He did some chemoinformatics. He got some groups. He didn't stop there, though. He then looked at those groups and thought about potential molecular initiating events. So here is one of his similarity-based groupings. And I've quoted Noel values at you. Um, here, these are drawn out of the um, out of the SCCS opinions. Here are some chemicals. Chemical similarity would get you there. And you say, well, there's a group. That looks pretty good. That's a group of lambs. But look at the spread in the Noel values. Not great, but perhaps not too bad. Importantly, when you look at those data, mechanistically, one data point sticks out at you. If you've, done, if you've done the mechanistic analysis, you've gone to the literature, you've thought about the potential chemistry that might be going on here. And I stress that the reason we're interested in mitochondrial toxicity is because it's thought to be a pretty good driver of chronic toxicity. And um, if you read the drug discovery literature, they're really interested in it. So that's the hypothesis that Mark was interested in. So you have a data point, and you're th thinking, why have we highlighted this? Well, we can highlight it for two reasons. We can highlight it because it has a rather erroneously large Noel value, but importantly, that chemical does something different mechanistically. So if you use statistics to get us this far, we've grouped, we've just checked it at a computer, but that data point is unusual. And so we've had to analyze each chemical individually to convince ourselves that the underlying mechanism of the group is, is consistent. And what you find is for every chemical that wasn't in a red box, there is evidence in the literature that they can undergo a free radical mechanism. They can interfere with mitochondria, picking up electrons, taking them from complex one to complex four, disrupting electron transport chain. You now have a pretty solid hypothesis for this group. That other chemical that's in a red box, if you read about it in the literature, you discover it can do some other stuff too. Its mechanism potentially is different from the remaining chemicals in the group. How did we find this out? We read the literature. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to, well, this chemical is different, it's not part of the group, it's a lamb banana in a group of lambs. The remaining data, the remaining chemicals, we can define an alert. And we can define that alert and say, here is a structural alert. You can use it to group chemicals. The hypothesis is about mitochondrial toxicity. It may be useful to you for grouping for repeat dose. Here's another, here's another group that Mark came up with. These are some azo dyes. These are all drawn from the uh, hair dyes data, of course. Here's another group. They've got a range of Noel values. Again, it's not the Noel values that we're using to say a chemical is an outlier. That's not what we're doing. I'm just quoting the Noel values to give you an idea. We're looking at the chemicals in the group and trying to understand are their mechanisms the same. 
No one's saying that because one chemical has a Noel value of 180, you should suggest it's an outlier straight away. It's the chemistry that drives that decision. And yes, this does involve chemistry and lots of it. So here it is again. You have something rather similar, slightly different mechanism. This time we've got a, a redox cycling type approach. Again, it's an interference with electron transport chain. But the chemistry is slightly different. And the group that comes out is the outlying chemical, which was on my, which is this chemical this time, is realistically this chemical looks rather unusual because it actually has multiple azo bonds. And that would lead you to an idea that a chemical where you have one azo bond, you get metabolized in one way, you get some reactive metabolites. This is going to be different. Perhaps the load might be twice as much. And maybe that does rationalize why that chemical is much more toxic. But the, the point here is that the mechanism is different. So when I write my alert, my alert won't group that with the remainder of the azos. So I've used chemical similarity and said these chemicals are similar. They have similar structural features. I then looked at the chemicals in the group, and I figured out the underlying mechanisms from a, a hypothesis about mitochondrial toxicity. I then am able to say, right, I can write you an alert now that if I profile a database, would put these chemicals in one group and would exclude those, that chemical for a mechanistic reason. And maybe I, I start to get some sensible trends in the data I'm looking at. And what does this result in? This results in about six structural alerts. So here's six structural alerts related to mitochondrial toxicity that Martin Elms derived during his PhD. The supporting literature that goes with this took an awful long time. And that goes back to the manual aspect of this work. So you end up with six structural alerts, so you've got good mechanistic hypothesis around what's going on. It's not going to help you with every single chemical in your data set. There will be some chemicals that when you profile are lamb bananas. Well, tough luck. It's, you know, they're just out of your domain. However, if your chemical falls into one of these, you might be able to group, you could group on the, on the structural alert, and if there are data available for the endpoint you're interested in, chronic toxicity here, you might be able to make a prediction. And you can draw on what Christoph showed before. You could look at a Noel value. You could draw the supporting information around organ level effects from the database based on the alert. And that's what you, that's what you should be doing, should, should be looking at. And the alert has been developed for you based on that mechanistic hypothesis. This is the Zang data set. This is something slightly different. This is an alternative approach. This is a little bit more statistic-y. But we can use some other software that we have access to as well, which is the chemotyper. So the chemotyper allows you to explore a data set and allows you to do some of this analysis yourself by highlighting, you have a data set here, it's the same data set, mitochondrial toxicity. It lets you have a look at which fragments are more likely to be in active chemicals versus inactive chemicals. And again, we've used this tool to help derive alerts, which you have uh, an underlying, uh, you can have an underlying um, mechanism for. And the nice thing about the chemotyper is that if you download the chemotyper software, which is free from Molecular Networks' website, you can use the alerts that are encoded as, as chemotypes and encoded in CSRML. You can import them into this software, and you can start to group your own chemicals on your own computer. And there are the links there at the bottom. So what else have we done? So I've just summarized the PhD students' entire PhD in about 10 minutes. Disappointing, but that gives you a flavor for how much work is involved in supporting Mark's cursing me currently, isn't he? Um, but but that, what the point I'm trying to make is it gives you an idea of how much work is involved in supporting those alerts. An alert on its own is not much use unless it has a mechanistic hypothesis underneath it. Otherwise, when Nora takes it to her toxicologist, the toxicologist turn around and say, well, what's this about? Tell me why, what's the rationale for why you group these chemicals? Um, are we happy with Michael? We've got to the point where we're happy with Michael acceptance. That pleases me. <laughs> Shift base formers? Not yet. Not yet. One step at a time. But the point being that if we can accept that Michael acceptors might be useful for grouping skin sensitizers, we are on a road that suggests that this approach is actually the way forward. So nuclear receptors, we did something uh, earlier. We tried to have a demo of this earlier this morning. We did something similar. It's another PhD student's work. Uh, we did something similar with nuclear receptors and a, and a similar approach. The idea being that grouping your chemical based on its ability to interfere with a nuclear receptor is not a prediction on its own of liver toxicity. It's a tool to allow you to group your chemicals together. You have a hypothesis. I'm interested in, in steatosis. I could use this profiler 
Propyl myelin chemical, okay, does it flag up as a potentially hitting a nuclear receptor? Fine, maybe it does. Profile the Cosmos database, get back a group of chemicals that um, inhibit the nuclear receptor, and all of a sudden I can pull back the data that Christoph was talking about. Maybe now I can make a prediction of my novel chemical. And that's the link. It's about grouping chemicals, using the, the data in the group to make a prediction of your unknown. And there's a range of uh, receptors that were investigated, basically those that were in the literature. It's a nice picture. 251 ligands. And the point again is that this effectively comes down to a nine workflow. This is why that nine workflow was so complicated this morning. That's what's underneath that nine impl implantation that you looked at. The point of this though is it basically profiles your chemical and tells you whether it should or should not interfere with a nuclear receptor. Then we get down to this is what the screenshot would be. Again, you've had a little play with this this morning or lunchtime. The idea, again, will be to profile your own chemical and then go back and pull analogs from the Cosmos database. So in summary, because I'm very aware that it's now five to three and there's T. So the mitochondrial toxicity story, the hypothesis underlying mitochondrial toxicity is that if you read the drug discovery literature, you discover that drug discovery are pretty Pharmaceutical industry are pretty convinced that mitochondrial toxicity is very important for chronic toxicity. I can do it without the slides. It's very important for chronic toxicity, hence the hypothesis that if you're trying to group chemicals together for a repeat dose, it's fine, I can do it without, I can do it without the slides. If you're trying to group chemicals together for a repeat dose, mitochondrial toxicity might be of interest to you, hence the derivation of the alert. The next slide basically says there are some alerts in the chemotyper, which we saw they're available. The profiler is available. Uh, there is a publication. That's right. Yeah. And then as we saw the nuclear receptor story this morning, a similar story with nuclear receptor. If you read the literature, the nuclear receptors have been associated with steatosis. If you're interested in that as an endpoint, that's a starting point. And then I've got some slides that don't make any sense when you can't see them because they're resource slides. They're just basically the nine information you saw uh, this morning. It's fine. These guys have seen them. And I've got an acknowledgement slides that we don't need to see. Um, I think that's a great illustration of the issues of collecting the data, what we can get from the data, and also the difficulty of interpreting, interpreting the data. So as users of the Cosmos output, what you will see are these structural alerts. Yeah, and have the ability to go back to uh, the mechanistic understanding and rationale for them and to be able to use those to get some insight into the toxicology of, of a particular molecule. I, and the slight confusion to those of you online that the projector went on holiday yeah. about five minutes ago. So I guess the point I didn't make is that the idea of a profiler is that you don't need to be the expert. The, the alert has been written and developed in such a fashion that you should be able to group and the group should be pretty robust. And then the supporting metadata, the documentation lets you investigate why has this group been grouped in this fashion? There will be all the chemistry. Okay, and the power of what we've done in Cosmos is using the newer technologies to capture Sorry. that chemical information and put it into these nine workflows. Are there any quick questions in the room or clarifications? Uh, Steve Gutzel from Unilever. It's a, it's a very top-level question. I understand the, the logic with the Cosmos project and how it's all focused around um, data availability from cosmetic chemicals. However, when we get to the stage of extracting information and knowledge in the form of structural alerts and profilers and various other things, there's obviously an awful lot of useful information that can come from non-cosmetic chemicals. Are there plans in the future or with other projects, perhaps in the Sure App cluster, to combine data sets, knowledge from other chemical sectors because, personally speaking, I never get too hung up on the chemical space. Is the pharmaceutical chemical space the same or different from the cosmetic chemical space to another industry chemical space, provided you define your domains correctly and you apply the tools sensibly? I think you can use knowledge from lots of different places. Yeah, I guess I don't know the answer to where there's one to, to combine the, the data. However, I agree with your point entirely in that one of the two data sets that Mark looked at was a pharmaceutical data set. 
you know, the Zang data set is the pharmaceutical data set. You tend to end up looking at pharmaceutical data because we have pharmaceutical data and more of it in the literature. So I entirely agree, but I don't know whether there are any plans. Uh, yes, yeah, I think I, I totally agree that the body does not recognize a molecule as a cosmetic ingredient, a drug, a pesticide, etc. Within the Cosmos databases, it stands there are ingredients that are not, that are, would not be used as cosmetic ingredients, and a whole range of other ingredients. Um, clearly as well, another initiative that has gone on within Cosmos um, in collaboration with the ETOX project, which is an EU IMI um, pharmaceutical project, is to look at the overlaps between the Cosmos database and ETOX and think about, we haven't done it, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but think about the possibilities of, of where that could go and if it is impossible. And, and at the moment, that has not happened. But we have looked at chemical space of the, the inventories uh, within pharmaceuticals and for cosmetics ingredients. Within Sure Act, we have the ToxBank initiative, as you're probably aware, which is a, a data warehousing um, projects that's more storing the data. But I think you're right. As we go forward, these Cosmos gives you the opportunity to insert further data in. And that's, I think, where Chihei and I certainly, when we, we think about it, would, would love this to go. It's not restricted to cosmetics ingredients, and it will be more powerful as it goes forward. Again, again for my passion for the data, currently, when you use cosmetics and for the Cosmos database, you're not just actually searching for cosmetics. It's most of the chemicals are food chemicals, food additives, direct and indirect, and then there are cosmetics and colorants. So you, there are actually the in terms of chemical space, it's a wonderful space. Yeah. Any other questions, comments in the room, Catherine? And I would ask if anyone online has a question to put it in the chat box, and we may get to you. Catherine Marnie, Procter and Gamble. So short of whipping your PhD student harder or putting more in the boat. How could you accelerate this sort of work? That's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I guess, the, I guess the, the software tools that we have, things like the chemotype help and being able to cluster chemicals so it's a little bit quicker. But I'm not sure if there's a, a replacement for the literature angle. That's the bit that takes the time, is going to the literature, developing the hypothesis that you need to convince someone that actually what you're saying may well be true. If I just had given you a, gave a talk and said, okay, mitochondrial toxicity is really important, it's the most important thing ever, without any underlying literature, you'd never believe me. So I don't think there is. I think you just have to accept that, or we have to accept that it's a slow process. And if we're only accepting Michael acceptors right now, we've probably got time. Indeed. But I think the, the literature part is so important because you've got to make those arguments that the, that group that I'm putting towards you is, is quite robust. So I think the answer is um, making the PhD students work harder. Well, I'm, I'm all for that, but also we must bear in mind what is happening with the juggernaut that is becoming the AOP um, and the information that can give us, which Mark linked on in, in this work and you linked on in this work but didn't exist. And it may be that the AOP knowledge may give us a framework to speed things up in, yeah. in the future. And it may also give us the direction to go to. Um, in order of time, there's no questions in the chat box from anyone online. Um, and um, is there anyone online who wishes to say anything? Okay, um, I apologize if you did wish to ask a question. Please, please email us. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to close the discussion. We're going to... It's, 3 p.m. in Liverpool. Okay. Um, there's a question, is there a way that we can download the NOAA values and TOX data to our current software? Would it be legal to use the question? Um, I don't know what your current software is. Please contact us. But yes, um, at the end of the year, you will be able to, to download the NOAA values in a flat format, whether it's text limited Excel and take that into your software should your, your current software be able to, to cope with that. Uh, well, providing you've got a legal version of your software, I suppose, and it, it will be legal. So it is legal from our perspective, yes, to use the NOEL values in, in that sense. Okay, thank you. But, yes, to, to, to be used responsibly. Okay, thank you for, for, for the question. I, I hope that clarifies. If not, do, do contact us.